And here we are. All right, Siri, how are you, man? I'm good, my brother. I'm really yeah. good. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for uh, being on the podcast. I, I wanted to have you on for a long time. And I have, well, we tried to schedule it, I think, before the pandemic. But previous to that, um, I, uh, I was wanted to have some distance from the Runyon thing. So I just wanted time just like to chill out. Um, but I asked you something off the podcast, which I'm, how do you say your last name? Kalas? Uh, Kalsa. So K-H-A-L-S-A. Kalsa. Right. Rhymes with salsa. Kal okay. <laughs> if only I would have known that previously. Um, yeah. So that is, is that a, uh, a Sikh last name or is that a Yogi Bhajan last name? So... It's definitely a Sikh last name, but I also think it falls under the umbrella of what Yogi Bhajan was doing. It's Kalsta, it's affiliated kind of like a, a tribal thing. So everyone that was born and raised and even adopted the Sikh religion under Yogi Bhajan um, took on the last name of Kalsa. So there's thousands of Kalsas out there. Um, I'm only blood related to, uh, well, Two of them now it was three, my dad, my mom, and my sister. Okay. Um, that's interesting. So everyone that was under the Yogi Bhajan group was Khalsa, like Salsa. So yes. uh, um, Harry Jiwan, uh, he has the same. Yes. I didn't, okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, what about so a, a lot of them don't like use that, say, on their public profiles like there's another amazing artist named Simrit and she just goes by Simrit or Simrit Carr and there you know so there's a distinction the men have um, not a prefix but a uh, part of the name is Singh and which you know the men take on Singh the women take on Carr I, I can't even give you the actual definition of what that is uh, right oh. now so I would be my full name is Siri Saib Singh Khalsa my mom's name is Amrit Kar Khalsa. Um, you know, so like Hari Jiwan, Simrit, even Tej, like, you right. know, she, yeah, she's Tej, but she's also Tej Kar. I, I rarely see any of her um, posts or whatnot, you know, or her social media handles say Tej Kar Khalsa, but I'm almost 100% sure if you were to look at her ID, it would say Khalsa. Right. And then Guru Singh, who people always tell me to go see who I've yet to do, um, so it came from the same thing, right? Because he has Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, interestingly, Guru Singh is his like name encapsulated. So I don't think there would also be like another Singh. It wouldn't be Guru Singh Singh, but his name in particular, where say if you were to say my name, Siri Saib Singh Khalsa, um, you can also just say Siri or Siri Saib, but I go by Siri. Uh, but Guru Singh, I don't think you just call him Guru. You know, you like his name has the Singh attached to it. Uh, right. Yeah. So I live uh, down the street from the Sikh. Uh, there's a Sikh building, which is on Vermont, just above Franklin, I think. Mm -hmm. So is that because I've talked to you a little bit about this before, and I think I know the answer, but I want you to explain a little bit. Is there a difference between the Yogi Bhajan community and the actual Sikh community? <laughs> uh, yes and no. And that, man, that is a big question to unpack. Okay. Um, well, I don't even know where to start. But, but what I can definitely say is that, you know, I'll give you a little background. So Yogi Bhajan, uh, the primary man that brought Kundalini Yoga to the West in 68, 69. He's definitely not the first and he's not the only person that has shared Kundalini Yoga. He, he did not invent Kundalini Yoga. He definitely, from what he says, he became a master at a very young age and that's what he shared. Um, so what's interesting is that Yogi Bhajan was also a Sikh. Now, being Sikh and being Kundalini Yoga, they don't necessarily go hand in hand. Sikhism, um, I, I think, is generally one of the newest religions, only being like a few hundred years old. Um, okay. But Kundalini Yoga, if you look at the scriptures, it says it goes back, you know, 
5,000, 10, you know, really, really old. Like there's um, yogis doing this a really long time ago. Um, so what's unique about what Yogi Bhajan did, there's many things, uh, but he actually took Sikhism as well as Kundalini Yoga and fused the two in a really unique way. So, you know, you don't necessarily need to be religious to practice Kundalini Yoga. Um, it's definitely a spiritual yoga. Um, but what he did is he brought in um, Sikh Sikhism and intertwined it with Kundalini Yoga. So, um, you know, a lot of the converts, my parents were two of them back in the 70s. Um, they adopted the Sikh religion once they, you know, became devout followers of Yogi Bhajan, because that's what he suggested. So a lot of people don't know that, you know, Yogi Bhajan did this fusion with um, the religion and Kundalini Yoga. Yeah, and I thought that you would be the person to, well, it's been laid upon you to explain, at least in this moment, because I've always been curious about um, the different, because they don't, they, to me, I see them kind of as separate entities. And as you said, they kind of are. Perfect. And so that gets me back to answer your question. Actual Sikhs in India don't necessarily practice Kundalini Yoga, right? That, that's, they don't, go hand in hand. And in fact, what Yogi Bhajan did in the 70s or 60s when he brought Kundalini Yoga over was very against the grain. Um, you know, no one, none of the Kundalini Yogis wanted him to do that. I believe even the Sikh community did not want him to do that. And so um, there's definitely a separation between like Indian Sikhs and Caucasian white American Sikhs. And I I'll go out on a limb and say almost all the Caucasian Sikhs here in the West or all around the world that practice Kundalini Yoga and follow Yogi Bhajan, um, they wouldn't be Sikhs if it weren't for Kundalini Yoga. So I don't believe that they just joined the Sikh religion because they loved the religion. I believe they loved Kundalini Yoga, they loved Yogi Bhajan, and he encouraged them to sort of follow in this path. But interestingly, um, Yogi Bhajan, aside from fusing that with Sikhism, which, you know, at this point, it's really hard to tell what are the Kundalini roots and what are the Sikh roots, because all of the mantras that he teaches and has shared throughout the years um, all have like Gurubani and Sikh um, roots. Okay. And, and, but those are also things that the actual Sikhs practice, right? Um, there's, there's so many different practices. But one thing Yogi Bhajan also did was he created something called 3HO, which is essentially the Healthy, Happy, Holy Organization. And this is something that essentially was a lifestyle. I think it became a business or an organization, but it, it was a way to encapsulate everything that he was doing, not just with Kundalini Yoga, but with lifestyle from diet and sleep and, you know, how you literally how you do everything, how you wake up, how you go to sleep, how you eat, how you commune with others. And so there's a lot of people that practice Kundalini Yoga, especially now that don't uh, identify as Sikhs. However, they definitely follow the 3HO lifestyle. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. And um, so then did you see the Source family documentary? I did. <laughs> no, it's, I love that movie. Yeah, I, really interesting. Yeah. And I what, have actually, What was his name? Father Yah or Yahweh? Uh, Yod. 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 There it is. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he would have came out of that community? You know, I, I don't know that particularly. Interestingly, when I did watch that documentary, a lot of what he was practicing with the yoga, like waking up at four in the morning, doing the yoga in the morning, having, you know, an ashram style where they all lived. Um, it, to me, it seemed like there were lots of crossovers, but I didn't, I didn't necessarily see like a direct, like, okay, he, he was a Kundalini Yogi Sikh, even though I see resemblances of what was going on there. I think my interpretation is he was trying to do like his own thing and be his own Yogi and guru and master. Um, really interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I remember there's a scene in the movie uh, or a, a, it's a documentary and they're talking about how Father Yod went to the source uh, restaurant, which is now like a tequila bar. On, sure. uh, was it that his restaurant? Didn't he start that? Or it was, 
Yeah, it was Father Yodes. And the yeah, whole okay. community ran that. But um, Yogi Bhajan went there and he went up to Father Yodes and said, this should be mine. Ah, <laughs> So I, I thought that they had some kind of like, uh, you know, like hierarchy, like teacher, student kind of thing, because I felt that there was like, like a pressure of some kind. But I maybe misinterpreted or, or projected my own BS onto it. Yeah, you know, my understanding is because Yogi Bhajan was definitely a businessman as well. And he started many businesses under kind of this Kundalini Sikh umbrella. My understanding was that Father Yod was just really inspired by what Yogi Bhajan was doing and kind of wanted to create his own thing. But right. again, I, I could be wrong. It's just my interpretation. Yeah. I did a lot of uh, Kundalini yoga stuff for a couple years, real hardcore. And um, I actually, I know the answer, but I've always been super curious about, because you talked about like, you don't have to be a Sikh, but they do uh, in some of the classes with some of the teachers have a tendency to kind of lean you into that lifestyle a little bit or at least big, my big time yeah yeah um, because you know a lot of the teachers like what you're talking i don't know who you were with maybe it was like Tej or how did you want yeah yeah mostly how did you want and Grumuk, well, yeah. they were literally some of his first um you know kind of devotees and so they adopted the lifestyle like all in a thousand percent and so you know of course there's going to be a, a push to kind of like get everyone to adopt this lifestyle i i you know i was born and raised in the sikh kundalini community in a berkeley and ashram and it wasn't until i was like 27 28 when i actually did the full teacher training with gurmukh and you know all the teachers we mentioned above and kamala was uh doing it with me as well um what what was actually refreshing is that they didn't necessarily push like if you're going to do this and be a teacher you should be a Sikh but they definitely pushed the lifestyle really hard of like not eating meat no doing drugs or alcohol you know sex was sacred and really should only happen once or twice a year um, you know wake up at 4 a.m do the sadhana and uh, that's a turnoff for a lot of people you know it's not like going to a hatha class where it's like you can go in get your yoga and leave and they're not pushing a lifestyle on you where kundalini yoga and and i'm gonna say specifically for like the og teachers like we mentioned guru singh uh tej i don't say she pushes it but definitely in the teacher training they're like there's dogma so they're like if you want to be the best person the most clean soul the most highest version of yourself you should be doing X, Y, Z, and all of these things, and, and almost to a fault where if you don't do them, there's guilt attached or a stigma attached, or like right. you're not as, as good or holy as you possibly could be. And, and uh, for me personally, that's definitely a turnoff because everyone needs to find their own form and version of spirituality. And, and I think sometimes the most dogmatic ones are, you know, there's... There's just a lot of baggage that goes on with them. Yeah. Um, I remember you going through that. And I remember you talking about, you know, this pressure. Um, I, I was just standing in your kitchen. I remember you mm -hmm. telling me that. So I've, I've quite got a bunch of questions. So yeah. what is drugs and alcohol? Like, so you, cause you back, mm -hmm. uh, they said, no, does that include like marijuana? Big time. Oh, okay. Pretty much anything that kind of alters your consciousness. So, you know, alcohol, I think coffee. was, uh, yeah, caffeine, not so much. Um, even though that technically is a drug, caffeine's a drug. Um, so it was definitely more of like the illicit substances. So yeah, cannabis. Um, and especially back in the day, 70s, 80s, when the war on drug was like huge. And so therefore, you know, even cannabis, which is now recognized at a, as a medicine, um, it, it was a huge stigma. And, and that's where I had a hard time with the teacher training. And because at that time, when I did it nine years ago, cannabis was not legal. It was definitely recognized medically, but I loved weed. I still do love weed. Right. Right. I'm not a daily pot smoker now, but when I was going through that teacher training, you know, I was smoking all the way up until I did it. I actually 
you know, because I, I, I do have a strong sense of discipline and I do like to go full in, when we did our teacher training, I committed to not using alcohol or any drug, illicit substances. So no weed, no alcohol, uh, no other kind of party drugs. I did not subscribe to the 4 a.m. every morning waking up. <laughs> but on our teacher training weekends, I did because we'd, we'd everyone as a group, we'd collectively go and wake up at 4 a.m. And in fact, it's actually, for me, easier if I know there's a group of people doing that. But for me on my own, like, I love sleeping until 9.30. That's just me. And here's a silly question. Do you get up at 9 a.m.? You don't get to go back to bed later in the day, right? Oh, actually. A, Is there a nap time? You And you meant four, right? Four, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, four. Um, Actually, they would recommend, and even many of the practitioners would do this. So you you get up at four. The idea is, you know, you take a cold shower, which that is one thing I adopted during my teacher training, and I haven't stopped since. It's literally one of my favorite hacks of all cold water therapy. If if you haven't tried it, or if any of the listeners are watching or listening, it is like one of the best things you can do, simplest best things that you can do to like give your body and brain and nervous system and all your internal organs, your skin, everything, even your willpower. It gives you this amazing boost. And we talk about it in almost every one of our yoga classes too. Um, the question I started rambling. It's okay. Um, I finish cold. Exactly. That's what I do. Yeah. Okay. So okay. I don't, I, yeah. I don't I, start cold because honestly, I don't think that cleaning yourself in cold water is effective so no the soap doesn't work as well exactly so i'm like you i i definitely start hot or warm but i usually give myself at least one minute at the end to like just be in the cold water right right yeah, yeah i have a hard time with it in the winter so we were talking about naps so you're getting up at 4 yes. a.m and then yeah so you do generally the sadhana which is like sadhana all uh, it all uh, really translates to is like a daily personal practice. Um, however, in the Kundalini Yoga, Sikh, uh, I'll just say Kundalini Yoga as taught by Yogi Bhajan, you know, you wake up at four because there's a special time of the day, I guess, like the electromagnetic frequency of the the earth. Um, it, it's at a very specific vibration. They call it the Amrit Vela, which is like the divine nectar. And to be honest, when I did wake up that early and I practiced, so the sadhana would be roughly about two hours. And it's not, you're not doing yoga necessarily the whole time. There's lots of chanting. There's lots of sitting. There's lots of meditating. It roughly is about a two hour, 90 minute, two hour practice. Wow. And I, when I did that practice with the group, and then once I was done, I, I mean, I really felt elevated and lifted. Like there's something to it. I, I'm, I'm not like bagging on it. Um, it's just hard for me in my daily life to like make that commitment to wake up every day at four. So I do my sadhana throughout the day. So I have a practice that I do at like nine in the morning. I have a midday practice and then I have like a very end of the night evening practice too. But to get back to your question, once you're done with your sadhana, you actually could go back and take a nap, say from like six to seven, and then from, you know, then wake up oh. at seven and then go and, you know, do your work day. So that, that was not necessarily encouraged. It wasn't frowned upon. It was just, you can do this if you need to. Okay. Yeah. Now, did they consider certain foods drugs because when i was uh doing some of my studies in india they told me uh no garlic no onions uh anything like mm. that Be and because of the excitement of the nervous system that's brought on by mm. those foods um not to my knowledge and you know there's a heavy rooting of ayurvedic food knowledge and ayurvedic ayurveda in the kundalini yoga Sikh community um but you know essentially meat was like one of the things that was like a no-no to eat. So like dairy was okay. Um, the herbs you mentioned, garlic, onions were actually like part of a, a perfect trifecta of healing food like kitchari, which is mung beans and rice. You may be familiar. That was one of like the staples. It's, it's actually, I love it. It's a really good gut healing. Like if you're sick or just need something like full of protein, but easy to digest. Um, the base of that is um, sauteed onions and ghee and garlic and a bunch of um, herbs and spices. And then with vegetables, mung beans, rice, and it's cooked over like a few hour period. And even 
really served like the next day. So it, it, I mean, it, it looks like a goulash. It looks like a mash, but man, it, <laughs> I was eating that from like the time I was a baby. So I, I have like a very fond recollection um, of that. So to answer your question, um, there were, there were no real specific foods, you know, like in Ayurveda, they classify people as having different doshas, which essentially I'm not an Ayurvedic practitioner, you know, by training, but I, you know, I follow a lot of the concepts, you know, each person is going to have specific foods that they should eat for their body type, their dosha, their blood type. Um, you know, so one food that's good for one person is not necessarily going to be good for another. Um, there was lots of like fasting, like cucumber fast, water fast, watermelon juice fast. Um, so they're like big, big, big time on fasting in that community. But, you know, to answer your question, I, I don't remember about um, any of those foods particularly. I mean, if there were, it would be like junk food you know, but, right. but, but interestingly, like, you know, even Yogi Bhajan, he had like liver, liver damage, liver disease. He was like full on diabetic in the end of his life. He ate a lot of junk food. Um, so right. there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, what do you call them? Uh, not, uh, oxymorons, but a lot of like, do as I say, not as I do, you know? Yeah. Well, I think that we get in well, and I've only seen this as like, uh, the weird position in my life um, where we have to like accept this humanness of our teachers. Yes. You know, cause it gets real, can get real weird, you know, and the pressure can be uh, that you apply to yourself can get like, you're like, Hey, wait a second. You know, mm -hmm. um, that's real, man. That's yeah. very real. And I, I've done a lot of work around that because obviously under Yogi Bhajan, he was like, the master and no one else knew as much as he did. So there was already this separation um, that was created between him and all of his students or followers or devotees. And interestingly, you know, my dad fell into that really hard. He was like, you know, whatever Yogi Bhajan says is like God's word, uh, which a lot of them did. Um, right. I, I had to do a lot of like wrestling with this one because a lot of what he said wasn't for me, it, it didn't necessarily work for me. And I feel like that's why I said spirituality is a really personal path, you know, and, and that's so much of, you know, you had Kamala, my partner on here. Uh, that's so much of what we share in our, I'll say brand, but in our experience called Yoga Galactica is that we're, you know, we're facilitators, but we're not gurus. We're not your shaman. We are not like better than you. We may have a little more experience. We may be, have done some work that allows us to be tapped into source at another level. But I personally think we're coming, we're leaving the day and age where, you know, there needs to be like one master, like one guru. And I feel like we're kind of opening and awakening to us being our own master and our own guru. And so I try to tell that to our students, you know, like, you know, thank you for all the praises. Thank you for, you know, everything you're sharing, but like, we're the same, we're equal, you know, like I, I use cannabis. I use some illicit substances. I eat junk food. I don't do all the X, Y, and Z to make me the holiest person. In fact, I try to be very forthright with it because I don't want to create an illusion that I'm something that I'm not. You know? Right. Well, it's interesting. Cause, and that's why I, I go over here and I write things down. So, so you said this, we don't want to come off as better than you. And something I've learned over a long time, of, I'm a watcher. I'm, I'm watching people. I'm watching myself if I can. What I've come to realize is I am certainly not better than you. Chances are I'm worse than you. And that is why I've done so much study on how to fix these things because I've been down the path that maybe someone is on now or I've experienced what they're experiencing or I've made that terrible mistake or I've done those things. Yes. So, so through that, my character defects, I've tried to better myself so that I know, well, this is how you can kind of maybe try to look at this or solve it. Yeah, I love that. And I think that's why people are so attracted to you in your practice. I mean, 
you know, we don't have to bring in Runyon Canyon to this. Obviously, everyone knows you're one of the staple teachers there. Kamala and I were for many years, but aren't now. But, you know, that's why I gravitated towards your practice so much because of how just humble and pure and raw you are. There's no like, I'm better than you. I know all the ways. It was just like you just sharing what worked for you. And that was inspiring. Like I, 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 I loved your, I love and loved your practice. Yeah, thank you for that. I have a very weird moment I want to share about the Runyon experience and why I think I don't, why I do what I do is like some kind of core thing that I haven't totally figured out. But I remember sitting there as a student, but I was also a teacher at the same time. I used to take all the other teachers' classes. And I remember having this feeling come over me that something was about to happen to the community. Like I felt this wave, like, you know, if you've ever surfed, you can feel it coming up underneath you, mm -hmm. you start to paddle. And I'm like, I felt this wave coming up underneath me. And I'm like, we're going somewhere. We hadn't mm -hmm. quite gone there yet. What year and, was this? Uh, maybe 2007 or six or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it, and it was just what you, Steve, Kamala, and Hannah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And th the classes started to get bigger, like all of a sudden. Um, and I remember talking to myself going, something's coming. Mm -hmm. You're going to be pushed. You know these people, they're going to be pushed too. It's going to be great but there's danger. And I said to myself, like I was doing like an internal prayer, hmm. you need to keep your head down. You need to keep your fucking shit together and you need to just fucking ride this wave to the beach, but be fucking cool. Right. And that has been my, and, and serve the people. Mm -hmm. And that is, I've kept that as my mantra in that situation for a long time. And after that is when, uh, KTLA came, LA Times came, and there would be classes that would, it was just like ridiculous. And it, it, it was like, and you know, when you're surfing, it's the same analogy, like that wave comes down and you're just like, you're in the washing machine. Mm -hmm. And you're like, be cool. <laughs> you know, and you're just like flipping around. So yeah, but, but thank you again. It's, uh, I, I yeah. it was this, there's a, there was just that moment where I was like, all right, this is coming. Yeah. How are you going to do it? You so know? what was the like average class? Like when you had that experience, what was the average class size then? And then what did it get to? I mean, cause I know when we were teaching, some of our biggest classes were like hundred, 120 or uh, did we? Uh, yeah. Hang on a second. That may have froze the video. I'm going to hit. No, there you go. Perfect. You're right back. All right. Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, so good. We're still rolling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't always remember like the numbers and stuff. There was, I counted, I tried to count a few classes and I still on record, my biggest class there was like 125 people. And that is a weird experience. It's like, I remember after teaching that class, like, there was my body was sore mm. um, just from, you know, that experience. Um, and that, you know, that, and I, I have another question for you that has something to do with that, but I'm actually going to go backwards a little bit. Sure. Um, so when I was doing the, uh, a lot of Kundalini yoga, um, there was all this talk of vegetarianism, which I had been long before the yoga thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I kept looking around and everyone was sitting on a uh, sheepskin. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and <laughs> for me, I, and like you said, these like opposed ideas. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is, this is, this doesn't, something's weird here, you know? Mm -hmm. And for a long time, and I, I'm, I have the answer, but I want to know, oh, I think I have the answer, mm -hmm. but can you explain the skin, the sheepskin, or anything around that? And if not, it's cool, because right? I eventually it came to me. And so, well, we'll get to that. Sure. Now. 
Yeah, so my understanding, like what you said, many of the Kundalini yoga yogis uh, practice on a sheepskin. You know, maybe there's a yoga mat under the sheepskin or a blanket, but then right. the sheepskin. Um, and my understanding is that um, what I was taught in the training was that when you practice um, Kundalini yoga, that's all right. I still got your audio. All right. Um, let's see if this works. Sorry, this is real bad right now. It's all right. And we don't got to sweat it. We may end up without the video and just the audio. Um, I'm actually using my camera as the webcam. I have you on my computer right here, but I'm using this because it's a much better camera and I forgot to turn it on like airplane mode. Oh. Um, yeah. And uh, so my apologies for that. That's okay. I, I hope I don't get any more of those because no one likes an interruption. It's all right. I'll be able to edit them out of the audio. Okay, perfect. So with, um, you know, my understanding is that like Many centuries ago, yogis that practice energy or um, yoga in caves, um, you know, they're sitting on like cold rock. And apparently, like when you're sitting just straight body to the rock, a lot of your, I guess, that prana or your energy, your electromagnetic field, that energy draws down into the earth. And when you put that sheepskin, which is like derived from an animal in between you, that energy stays in your body. So that was, that's the impression and my understanding of that tradition. And I also totally agree that it makes no sense to be a vegetarian and then go ahead and like use sheepskin. Um, so interestingly, when I was working at Golden Bridge back in 2009, 2010, um, they actually completely phased out the selling of all sheepskins because it was brought to their attention that like, what are you guys doing? Like, this is so um, opposed to what you're telling all of us. They started getting these like um, humanely sourced, like wool, actually they're really nice kind of pads, like a nice square or rectangular pad that, you know, no animals were harmed. I think it was still made from like wool fur in, right. um, straight from New Zealand and both myself and Kamala had one. Um, but yeah, they, they stopped selling sheepskins altogether. Gurmukh stopped using a sheepskin because they realized, okay, well, we're, we're saying one thing, but we're practicing something totally different. So we got to get an alignment here. Yeah. What was your understanding of it? Well, well, first of all, I had this weird thing and, and it actually went along well with my India studies. But when I go to a teacher, I don't often like ask a lot of questions. I'm just trying to get the information and I'm a collector of information. And then the questions can go on in my head or whatever. So I didn't, I, I didn't ask anyone. Um, but I went to, um, the uh, on Venice, the uh, Harry Krishna Center on Motor in Venice. I used to eat at the. Uh, they have a cafeteria there, and then there's a the the Govinda bookstore upstairs. And I randomly got a book, which I think I still have. I wish I would have took it out for this. I forgot about this, but this question just came up. And the book said that when meditating in the forest, you should lay a sheepskin on the ground because snakes will not climb on you because they will avoid the dead animal. And I was like, wow, okay, question answered. <laughs> okay, I mean, is that a scientific fact? I don't know, maybe, maybe it's true. Maybe that is what happened, you know, centuries ago. Like, it cannot be tested by science that snakes will avoid you know because the sheepskin it's not like it has blood all over it like this the hide's been tanned it's, you know so it's essentially just like a piece of leather with fur on it so uh you know don't i'm not like belittling what you're saying but it's funny to me to hear that okay listeners everything said today is yeah it's funny but um but when i read that i was like oh is that the answer because but so did that seem true to you or did it seem like someone kind of made that up? It was the first time I heard an explanation. Got it. So, and the explanation was outside 
of the Kundalini community because it was sure. in, in the Hare Krishna community. Mm -hmm. So, and it was, and I don't know that I don't, I've never been involved too much in the Hare Krishna community. So I, I don't really know their practices, but I like when information comes from different sources because then you can come to this thing that we can't seem to find in mo the modern world, which is like some semblance of truth. Mm. So if you can get information about the same thing from different areas, then you can come to some kind of conclusion about what the truth might be. <laughs> so, sure, sure. So, cross-referencing. Yeah, so I was like, oh yeah, okay. So um, we'll be done with the Sikh conversation in a moment. So, I don't mind. All, any questions are fine. You know, it's it, it's all good. It's you know, it's it's a part of my past. It's a huge part of my past. In no way am I ashamed. And in, in many ways, I'm actually very proud um, how I was born and raised. I don't. I'm currently don't consider myself a Sikh. I do practice Kundalini Yoga, um, and so I, you know, I love talking about. It. I kept my name. Um, right. Yeah. Would, would you have been able to, would you, do you have a, like a standard name or, or this? I don't a, know. Right. So yeah, I was born, you know, I was born into the religion. So my parents were already practicing. They both, when they converted, they adopted their Sikh names, uh, right. which was interestingly, Yogi Bhajan named them both Amrit Singh, which was my dad, and Amrit Kar, which was my mom. And he often did that. He would name couples the very same uh, name. So I don't know why he did that, but I just, that was a, a common thing. So I, w I never had a conventional name or a Western name. And in fact, Yogi Bhajan, he named all of the kids and everyone at that time. You know, now, like if you want to seek name uh, through Kundalini Yoga, there's like someone that you email and you tell them about yourself and whatnot. And they kind of, they have some sort of format to how they choose names for people. Like, for example, many of my friends that were in the um, teacher training with me, they were all like Western, you know, just LA or US natives all had conventional names, yet they wanted their spiritual name. And so, right. um, you know, you kind of apply for it. it. There is a little fee, I think, just for the service, but it's not like a huge thing. And, you know, then they would get their spiritual name from this person. And um, so, yeah, so my name, full name that we mentioned, Siri Saib Singh Khalsa, that was my birth name. And that name, Yogi Bhajan named me as he did all of the kids and people back then. Yeah, I can see the, why someone might change their name joining this new thing. And there's, it's like a, like you can almost remove your past mm. by changing your name. I've had like, I got into his discussions with people at one point, I, I think they got upset with me, but because I had had someone, I ran into someone at Golden Bridge and they were like, oh, hey, Daniel. And I was like, and I said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. And they said, oh, well, I have a spiritual name now. And I was like, yeah, I know, but I said I didn't remember your name anyway. So, it was, <laughs> you know, why are you telling me that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I had told that as a story and some people got a little bit upset, but, mm. you know, here's my, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I, you know, a lot of people that have Western names, um, I'm making a generalization, but this is from my experience of listening to them, is that, you know, their parents perhaps named them because they liked the name or they named them because it reminded them of their grandmother. There wasn't necessarily like a, a, a spiritual root to it. And, you know, once many of these people were kind of deep in this path of Kundalini Yoga and Sikhism, um, um, hearing everyone else with their spiritual names and kind of like evolving spiritually themselves. Um, they wanted to adopt a name that actually had, you know, a spiritual connotation. So all of the names that are given in the community have a translation. And so some are like, you know, bringer of light or divine nectar or, you know, like master, you know, like something along those lines. So, you know, it is what it is. Like if that's what they want to choose, I, I don't mind, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I didn't, you know, I felt like people thought maybe I was judging them in that moment, mm, but you know, sure. Something, things happen. You say things and people get upset. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? Um, <clears throat> yeah. I've, it, I've never changed my name throughout my life, but I have a lot of friends that do. And so I don't know, 
what goes on in the mind in that process of like what you're saying, kind of like clearing the slate and not being associated with your past and starting new. Right. Um, I have a lot of friends that when they change their name and I kind of forgot to call them by what they now want to be called. And this happens actually in the Burning Man community too. A lot of people have these burner names or playa names that they don't want to be referred to their old name anymore. Like they want to be referred to as like, I, I don't actually want to say any of them because I don't want to call out any of my friends, but yeah, yeah. they want to be referred to as like Lake or Starseed or, you know, Magic or, you know, like a Luminarium or like whatever it is, like, because that's what they identify with. So I've never had that experience of changing my name. So I don't really. Sorry, my man, this is. It's okay. I'm trying to figure out how I can um, go onto Wi-Fi. And I hope this doesn't mess up my feed. Can you still see me? No. But I mean, is the camera still working? It just came back on. Okay. It was off for a moment. <clears throat> but it's okay. Let's not sweat it. We probably won't end up using the video on this one. Oh, let's do it, man. Like show them, show them, show them the flaws. It's all right. Okay. okay. Yeah. This is the, I, don't, the I don't mind. I just feel bad because I feel like I messed up your video, but I, I don't, you know, like. <laughs> well, like I was telling you earlier, nobody looks at my YouTube page anyway. So, <laughs> but. Um, well, they may after this video, brother. Yeah, right. <laughs> What's wrong with them? <laughs> um, so I want to know about so Teenage Rebellion, as a member of this, uh, I, don't, I can't think of a good word, but New Age community. So did you see this? Did this happen to you? And at what point, and if you want to talk about it, how did you rebel? Because for me, rebellion as a teenager, it was too much, probably. Mm -hmm. Only in retrospect do I see that, you know, but it was a lot. And it was uh, intense. So did you have that? Yeah, really good question. So to give you a little background, um, I was born and raised in the community, um, the yoga kundalini community in an ashram. And I went to India when I was like seven and a half, eight. Oh, and I was wow. there for about six months. I got super sick and had to come home. And actually that moment was a very pivotal moment in my life and uh, my family's life because after that moment, my parents um, decided to get divorced, which is something that's like totally shunned upon in um, the Kundalini yoga community as, as it is in lots of um, cultures. Um, so, I was too young to be in the spiritual community and have my rebellion, but I'll give you my story um, to answer a little bit about the kids that were in the yoga community. Um, Cause my sister was four and a half, it is four and a half years older than me. So, you know, I did have lots of friends that were in those teenage years and absolutely like they, they wanted to try what, you know, they wanted to try pot. They wanted to try drinking. They wanted to try sex. Like some of them did get into drugs because I think it's like any young kid, they want to explore what the world is all about. You know, um, my rebellion really came in the form of not practicing um, the religion anymore. Because essentially when my parents got divorced when I was 10, both of them like our whole family separated from the religion. And in a way, we were a little bit ostracized for a number of reasons I'm not going to get into right now. Um, but we essentially, like my dad immediately cut his hair, shaved his beard. I think my mom cut her hair. My dad changed his name back to what his original name was. My mom still keeps her Sikh name. Um, so my rebellion came in the form of cutting my hair, not wearing all white, not wearing a turban, eating meat, you know, trying alcohol. Like, so, you know, I, the first time I smoked pot, I was 12 years old with my sister. Um, she was again, like older, she was in high school. I was in middle school. So, you know, it was one of those things where it was her and her friends were at our house and they were, you know, in a circle. And I was like, what are you guys doing? And they said, they told me what they're doing. And I tried and let's just say it worked. I got 
real high and it was really funny. And, um, you know, I, I had like years, um, well, like seventh grade, eighth grade, I was like really into smoking pot. Um, not like every day, but like I was in the skateboard culture. So I had lots of friends that we'd go skateboarding and smoke weed. And I always felt so guilty. And, and here's actually the even other thing when I was in my Kundalini training or even before and just after I always had such a like shame and guilt around smoking weed because of, of, you know, like the judgment that's put upon you from the community, from Yogi Bhajan, but then also the judgment I would put on myself of like, man, I'm doing something that's not in alignment, supposedly, even though in my body and like my desires, it was in alignment. Like I wanted to do this, you know, I didn't see it as being a hindrance. Um, right. So there was a lot of shame. Fortunately in my life, I was never a big drinker. Um, so I didn't have to rebel in that area. And, and to be honest, I've, I've always been like pretty much like a good kid. You know, my, my situation with weed and, and smoking a lot in eighth grade was probably like definitely a form of me acting out and rebelling, but you know, it never got, I never got into trouble around it. You know, right. um, I didn't try psychedelics until I was in college. When you ate meat, you had never eaten meat probably as your whole life. Did it make you sick? No. So interestingly, um, when the very first time I consciously remember trying meat, um, my mom told me a story of when her mom died, we were at the funeral and I was only like four years old and there was like a big buffet platter and she told me that I like immediately went to the like salami and the cold cuts and I just started eating them not even knowing what they were right. I don't have that memory but I, I trust her but I do my very first recollection of eating meat was being alone on a flight I was probably like nine years old I was going from New Mexico visiting a friend out there coming back and on the flight the in-air um, meal that they offer you was like a chicken meal and I remember they just put it down in front of me and I was alone and I had this like moral dilemma of like, well, what do I do? Like, this is the only food I have, you know, uh, I was nine. So it wasn't probably like a complex thought process, but it was definitely like, do I eat it or do I not? And I ended up eating it and I actually really liked it. So interestingly, the first meat that I ate like consciously after I was out of being a Sikh was when I was living with my dad and my stepmom and they made um, homemade hamburgers. And I remember eating that and thinking it was like one of the best things I've ever eaten. I, it, was, it, was, it just blew my mind. I loved it. And I pretty much adopted eating every and any kind of meat. Like uh, essentially I was so like starved to use lack of a different word to like just be normal like i just wanted to westernize like i right. grew up we grew up in the ashram i was wearing all white i had long hair like we were in our own little bubble and when i was in my bubble i felt fine i felt normal but like then when we went out into the world and like every you know all the kids had you know boys short hair girls you know hair down no one's wearing white everyone's eating their pastrami sandwiches or whatever like i just wanted so bad to fit in that like when i had the opportunity to cut my hair to eat meat to just you know listen to whatever music i wanted to aside from mantras or some sort of spiritual music i just jumped on it and like i didn't even look back for like 14 years that was pretty much from the time i was like 12 until like 27, 28, when I like essentially rediscovered Kundalini yoga. Right, wow. And then you came back to it, which is yeah. cool. Yeah. I, you know, you said you were nine years old on the plane and you said that you, that you didn't feel like as a nine year old, um, you were able to have like a complete like thinking experience. And now I think a lot of times, well, at least for me, I go back in time to revisit these memories. And I think that there's like an assumption that I do, like I'm using the brain of today, but going back and experiencing mm. that moment. So that was very interesting for you to say that. I mean, do you mm. have like any thought on that about like, cause like understanding that you didn't understand, that's pretty, 
that's pretty heady. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just feel like, you know, when you have so much life experience, um, you know, all of our decisions that we make, somehow our life experience plays a part in that. But when right. I was only nine, you know, I'm 38 now. When I was only nine, I'm only drawing from like five, four or five years of like conscious actual experience. So I, I really, you know, it wasn't a complex thought at all. It was just like, should I eat it or should I eat it? And is anyone going to find out? Right. You know, right. that was, that was really like, is someone going to find out? Okay. That was kind of what it came down to. And of yeah. course, I think my mom did ask me and I think I totally lied to her. Well, um, it, it's funny. And it just made me think, I remember being in my teens and sitting at a fast food restaurant with my friends and having been a, a Catholic, but it was a Friday night and Catholics didn't eat meat on Fridays. Mm. And we, we were sitting there eating burgers and my friend said to me, and I think we were high, he said something, how does it feel to be a sinner or something, you know? Oh and, I, and I was like, what do you mean? He's like, it's Friday night, we're eating meat. And I was like, and, it, and like I had, it was, it was very, it was very bizarre. So being Catholic, was that something that you did not practice observing not eating meat on Fridays? We did. My family did. But so I guess when the memory you're recalling, do, were you just not thinking about it at that time? Yes. Got I, like, it. I totally spaced out on it. It was just, yeah. I was just out getting stoned with my friends. So when he said that, what did you feel? I probably what you felt like some kind of like, like a mild amount of guilt, yeah. maybe a small amount of like paranoia, mm -hmm. you know, about like, okay, what did I just do? You know, cause we get imprinted with these uh, religious ideas as children, um, of like right and wrong, or at least from, you know, you probably didn't get the story of the devil. I don't know, you know, but right and wrong, the story of the devil, the, the, the garden of uh, good and evil, to, to eat from the tree of knowledge, and you know, all the do's and don'ts, and you know, this guy who like tells you these things, he's the priest, and you go there, mm -hmm. and so like all this stuff, and you're just like this little person, like, and like, you don't really have control over what you're absorbing and what you're not and what you're totally. getting imprinted with. And cause I, a few podcasts ago, I told someone about this, uh, like what someone would call a spiritual religious experience, but it involved Christ, you know? And I was like, had I not been raised a Catholic, would it have been Shiva? And the mm. answer is probably yes, you know, mm -hmm. cause we get these uh, deep imprints that I don't know if we can ever, which made me think about the name change because mm -hmm. to remove those deep imprints is very difficult for sure. If not impossible. Right. It's like a deep computer program. That's like so embedded in the hardware and software that, I mean, there's people that never get to rewrite those programs. And, you know, some people don't want to, but some people do because they realize all the guilt, you know, like, my mom's Jewish, so she was born and raised Jewish. So technically by blood, according oh. to the Jewish community, I would be Jewish. Right. But I wasn't raised Jewish, you know? So interestingly, that religion also goes along with a race as well. And there's not many other religions that are like that, you know? Like I could be Jewish just because my mom is Jewish, even though I've never practiced Judaism before. Right. Uh, but, the, you know, that one and like what you're explaining, um, you know, the kind of the sinning and repenting and the devil and the good and the bad and the evil, like there's so much guilt attached and judgment attached to these things that, um, yeah, man, those the, the programs run really deep and sometimes for good, but sometimes not, you know? Yeah. And it's funny when you said for good, I'm, I heard initially for good, like forever. Yeah. Right. It could have been taken that way. I meant uh, sometimes for benefit. Yeah. 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 But it's weird to attempt. It's weird. Well, it's kind of cool to see that and to, and then to address it and to know it's in your life. Because like you said, mm -hmm. a lot of people never, they live their whole lives. They never question it. And that early imprinting, they're like, that's the way it is. That's the way I'm born. And it's not even a question. But to take those moments and to go in and go, wait a second, 
you know, it's like the food pyramid, mm -hmm. you know, they told me this in school. I believed mm -hmm. this is how the, and like the other day. I mean, it, yeah. I was just going to say like racism, like that's so right. much of what that is. You know? Right. Right. But you were saying the other day. I, you know, I was, well, I've gone through different phases of working a lot as a yoga teacher. I've been very blessed and very lucky, but I went through phases where I was working uh, so much that I was often on the verge of exhaustion. Mm -hmm. And I had remembered when I went vegetarian, which was way before the yoga thing, way before, long, long, long time vegetarian. How everyone's screaming about, what about your protein? What about mm -hmm. your protein? So I assumed just, I it didn't even, I didn't even think about it or try to process it. I just made this assumption that I wasn't getting enough protein and that's mm. why I was tired, mm. right? So mm -hmm. I just, I started like doing protein powders or I grabbed mm -hmm. crappy protein bars and it really didn't change anything. Sure. But I like, but I had always assumed that because society had imprinted that onto me. Yes. You're a vegetarian, you're not getting enough protein. And then recently my mom said to me, she's watching the Zac Efron show. With I love it. Yeah, I know that. Down to earth. I've seen yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. And, they, and they said that you don't need all this protein. Exactly. And I'm like, fuck. Because, <laughs> <laughs> right? It wasn't the protein after all. <laughs> no. So like I'm chasing my tail, you know? Yeah. I'm chasing yeah. my tail trying to find this answer based on the information I have, based on what yeah. I'm imprinted with. But I'm imprinted with things that are keeping me from the answer because the imprint... The imprinting has told me other pathways. Yeah, it like keeps you like focused, narrow focused. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and that's interesting. Um, yeah, I was gonna say one thing, we're, we are under a false pretense that we need way more protein than we actually consume. Right. And um, there is plenty of protein in the, the you know, plants as well. Um, I personally right now don't subscribe to, um, being vegetarian or vegan. Um, I, I've taken somewhat of like a kind of a keto slash paleo diet um, with lots of room for um, indulgences. Like, I, I, you know, I like to live, I like to experience. And I think you brought this up earlier is like, we are having a human experience right now, you know, yes. and to like, to, in, you know, if you're depriving yourself of something you want to do because you think a higher power wants you to do that that's like in your head you know yeah. that's a construct and and that's actually what i was going to say about um your vegetarianism thing like the that psychosomatic the mind body connection is so real like i'm i've done lots of research read lots of books and even man i want to publicly thank you right now because years ago I was going through severe TMJ trauma, right. jaw pain, and I, I had constant back pain to a point where it's like hovering at a four, not bad enough to like put me out, but like I just had pain in my body. And you had me read the mind body prescription by Dr. Oh. John E. Sarno. And I'm not even kidding you, that book changed my life. And just reading it started to unwind a lot of that programming, but also let me know what the root of a lot of the chronic pain was. And, and I actually really did a lot of processing going into my childhood and looking at like areas that I'd never allowed myself to feel anger, you know, and I don't want to go too deep into any of that, but essentially, you know, his theory is that, you know, chronic pain, it was, is a result of repressed emotion that yes. never gets experienced. And so me going through this process of like looking at literally everything, like from like not being able to like eat cake to, you know, my parents getting divorced. And I, I looked at everything. I did, turned over every stone. And I'm proud to say that it's been like three years that I've been like literally pain free, like no jaw pain. That wow. literally after I read that book, the jaw pain just melted away. And it was, it was a point where I was waking up with migraines every day, like oh, severe. No. And I haven't had any back pain. And I'm so deep into the belief of the mind-body prescription, the psychosomatic connection, that in our yoga class, I, I, I don't want to say I preach it, but I 
very much share it a lot. I've recommended that book to dozens, if not hundreds of people. And I've actually uh, been able to kind of like illuminate their situation as well. So I publicly want to thank you so much for that right oh. now. Yeah. Oh, thank you for saying so. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that book is amazing. And it did similar things with me. And he talks about the book cure. You know, he refers to it in the writing. People get a book cure just from reading the book. Yeah, ju exactly. Just from reading it and, and hearing it. Because it's that other, it's the same as, like you said, the, the protein thing. You're like, wait a second. And then you start to, you get a perspective and you start to address and there's a little bit of work to do you and you can just read the book and get a cure then you can go back and do the writing he sure. proposes and yeah. yeah all that stuff yeah i i love uh his work it's just uh it's yeah. a, it's an, an incredible thing right on so back to what you were saying when your mom told you about that show uh the right. zach efron and hearing that we really don't need that much protein did that have a, an effect or a change on you at all psychologically yeah, yeah, I did. And I stopped chasing that. And I think, and my next thing is I'm, ch I'm not getting enough vegetables. <laughs> oh, interesting. Oh, but the, and, 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 I, and my dad was on the line too. And I said, I also have to uh, accept that I might just be tired. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. that people get tired exactly. and you're, you're doing this service and it's great. And, you know, people work way harder than me, you know. Um, so being tired, isn't the worst thing in the world, but I was just trying to like really troubleshoot it, you know, sure. and, and that goes back again to the beginning of our conversation about being the guru, you know, or about being, you know, I am the person who doesn't understand. And that's why I have information because I'm mm. trying. And so I didn't know. And I was confused. And so I'm searching and I'm trying to find the answer and what's work. And actually part of what I came to um, is I'm not getting enough magnesium. Man, magnesium is so important in our bodies. Yeah. Do you take yeah. the Calm supplement? I take the Trader Joe's uh, magnesium, which is uh, like a three different kinds of magnesium. They're 200 milligram pills and I take two a day, uh, 400 milligrams. And it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's like three dollars for a bottle. I know, I know. I started taking Calm a few years ago um, after literally hearing that, like, you know, ninety percent of American or adults like are magnesium deficient, and that you know that is like has an effect on our muscles, our body, our ability to relax. But interestingly, it also has an effect on our bowels. You know, right. I don't know if you've had this experience, but when I first started taking Calm, I just took too much. And man, that like cleaned me out to the point where it was uncomfortable. Yeah. You know? And I, I didn't even realize what it was at first. Then I was like, oh, I read on the back. It said, start small and increase your dose because it can loosen your stool. And I was like, oh, that's what happened. So, but now I take it regularly. I take like the perfect dose for me. And it, I just feel like, yeah, my body feels more relaxed. But I was also going to say to you, like, there's, so many factors in why you could be tired from, I mean, you name it, it could be like, maybe you don't have enough vitamin D, you need to be in the sun. I'm not saying you specifically, I'm just now yes. talking about generally, but like, you know, like, or, or yeah, like a vitamin deficiency, blood work, you know, doing blood work. It could maybe you're not getting like the deep REM sleep that you want. It also could be aligned up with something emotional in your life. If you're going through like a heavy traumatic experience or you don't feel, this is what I've seen people happen is if they're not like aligned with their purpose and it seems like you are very much aligned with your purpose and what you're doing and sharing and teaching and playing music and all that. But if there's some people that aren't, it can have, you know, like a physical effect on them because they feel like they're, they're not like fulfilling a path or they're not you know, being of service or they're not living up to their full potential. And I mean, that can also have an effect on you physically. Yeah. And that leads me to another question. <laughs> so it's another thing I've dealt with a little bit. And somehow I feel like we've talked about this and I don't know, but being a person who's in front of a lot of people or, and especially in the world we're in today, there's a collective, uh, heaviness right and uh that heaviness can sit on you and you can try to like uh kind of squirm out of it and i 
come to different methods and I used to not be able to deal with it at all. But do you have, you personally, and I, I have some, I mean, I do salt baths and I do the other things, um, but to deal with like um, the collective or to deal with the being um, on stage, like there's, cause there's an, there's a, uh, an emotional exhaustion that you can get to mm -hmm. from those elements. Do you deal with any of that? And what, are, and if you do, what are the ways that you've dealt with it? Yeah, re really, really good question. Um, you know, I think whether you're in front of a lot of people or not, we all can feel that collective heaviness, um, particularly right now in our day and age, you know, like, yeah. you know, for people listening or watching, like we're literally six months, seven months into uh, quarantine lockdown. And, and not only that, we're like two months of, away from a presidential election. And we're also just went through like California being on fire, having its worst fire of the year. So those are like big things, but then we also have our own interpersonal life. So like, just to give you an example, last week, like I had a breakdown, like I legitimately had a breakdown and it was, um, it was a kind of a dark moment for me. Um, and I felt just like the weight of everything kind of piling up. So yeah, to answer your question, um, you know, I've been in front of people, um, a lot through my life. You know, I was, what, what put me through college was like being a waiter. So I'm very comfortable talking to people. Um, I definitely went on to like, do like some singer songwriting stuff. So I was performing there then of course yoga. And so I feel very comfortable talking in front of people. Um, and you know, to be able to like, feel like you can give back in those situations, you really need to fill your cup. So to, to get back to answering, um, I have a practice that I do daily that is kind of like, there's like a no exceptions. Like, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't say, ah, today I don't want to do it. You know, I like do it every day and I've, I've pared it down to make it manageable so it's not like this mountain that i have to climb every day in order to like get to level zero or to feel normal uh, but usually what it is is you know i wake up i have a little routine of like getting outside drinking like water um doing some sort of movement so the the practice i'm doing now is i have a little rebounder like a mini trampoline and outside just for like 10 minutes i just bounce and i feel like the bouncing it like excites your cells it gets the blood the cardio going um and then i come inside and i sit down and i do a 20 minute meditation practice and it's after I do that, at, well, okay, last thing. And then I take my shower and I finish with a cold shower. And it's after I do that, you know, over an hour, I guess, I, all the pieces are about 10 to 15 minutes on their own, but I do it over the course of an hour. Then I feel like, okay, I can be in front of people because throughout this whole quarantine, Kamala and I have made the commitment to our community to live stream um, <laughs> every day. And man, when she first said that she wanted to do this, because I'll, I'll, I'll give her all the credit for this idea. Um, I was like, you're crazy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> because we, we're used to teaching twice a week in the right. evening at 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday and Thursday. Like, that's our jam. And, right. you know, and, and even that, like, it, it takes like, it takes energy, like what you're saying, to like build up that kind of whatever it is, strength, courage, self-confidence, self-will to like get in front of people and not just get in front of people, but then feel like you have something valid to share. Like you're not just in a, an imposter. You're just kind of babbling shit that you read somewhere, you know? Right. So it takes a lot. Um, you know, so... <laughs> And to, to be honest, there are lots of times where, and even many times in our past where, you know, say Kamala and I were driving up to Runyon Canyon and we literally like would get in a fight in the car on the way to Runyon and we're like yelling at each other in the car <laughs> and we have to do everything in our power to like shake it off and go up there and be of service. And it's, it's really an interesting thing. And you know, you're, you're, you've been a musician for a long time and there's almost this switch that it's like the second you 
kind of get up there and put yourself out there, something turns off and something else turns on. And you might be able to expand on this a little bit, but I definitely have that switch. Um, now, just real quick to go back into the live streaming every day when she mentioned this, and this was back in March when the whole quarantine started, I was like, you're out of your mind. Like we're used to teaching twice a week and you want to now every day at 11, 11 in the morning, you want to go live to the whole world. You know, granted it's only like whatever, sometimes 15, we end up having a couple hundred views here and there throughout the day. But like, you really want to make this commitment. Like, you know what you're saying, right? And she was like, yeah, like I want to give back. I want it. it was like, okay, first of all, we have no idea how long the quarantine's going. Um, second of all, like, this is a huge commitment. And I'm actually really, really proud that we have upheld that commitment to our best ability. And we have taught hundreds of classes throughout this quarantine. There's been days where we couldn't do it. There's been a week where we went away. So we've definitely, you know, had to kind of um, not always go live. But it's been a huge commitment. And even to jump on that, uh, train a little more is I'm not really a morning person. Like I said before, like I don't like waking up early. Like I love sleeping until my body naturally tells me to wake up. And so, you know, to like wake up, take care of our dogs, do whatever I need to do in the morning, have my shit together, and then like be somewhat normal to be able to go and then teach to the internet or whoever's watching has been a really big practice for me. So there's, there's definitely a lot that goes into it, but I would love to hear what you're, what, you know, what you have to say about that. Um, without fault, occasionally it doesn't happen. And we're going back to the things that we, uh, to help us come back to ourselves or to um, disconnect from the, uh... Sir, are you there? Yeah, did you, you lost my audio. Yeah, no, I, I got your audio, but I lost your video. That's really strange. I'm still here, so we can keep talking. Okay, cool. Let me fudge. I'll, I'll fudge around with my camera while we... Um, I like, lay in the bathtub every day with Epsom salts. Mm. Hot, hot bath. Um, just uh, And I don't call it a meditation because I meditate uh, also outside of that. But I, I lay in, in the salt bath, uh, which has magnesium in it as well, um, daily. And I, I, I lay there for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. And I do end my showers cold. And that is a staple in my life that I rarely go without. Um, I've also started to... Um, view things differently. And it's taken me a long time because so much of everything is about changing my mind, not changing the world, yes. changing my perception of the world and changing the way that I deal with the world because you know I'm not gonna change the world. Um, I'm gonna change myself. And I don't, the, a lot of the weight that I used to feel in, uh, when I was younger, I was taking on, you know? Yeah. Um, and what I had to learn, like, like a simple thing like going to the airport. Um, I used to go to the airport, and by the time I got to the plane, I would be like exhausted from the, uh, the people, you know? all the people around and everyone's stressed out at the airport. You go and you're checking in. I'm a dyslexic, so I'm looking at all these things. And just, but now I see the airport and life again. And I'm not a, much of a surfer, but like just as this wave. And I have to, like, you, have you ever tried to stop a wave? <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> yeah, right. Like it literally will crush you. So what you have to do is just like... I, I have to train myself before I get in the mode where I'm like trying to like push things away. Um, like it's this moment. I talked to Kamala about like this moment before you're triggered or this moment before you go into this other path. I literally have to tell myself like to just become transparent mm. and like a leaf and just, and go into 
like this deep, deep, deadly acceptance, like almost like a rag doll. <laughs> sure. And, and uh, like emotionally and almost physically and just like, okay, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm a leaf blowing around at the airport. So that's the headspace I get into if things like that get overwhelming in the collective. I remember Yvette took a picture of me on my, sitting on my stoop here when we first went into lockdown. I remember seeing that picture and going, oh my God, you're holding the fucking world on your shoulders right now. Mm. And I'm like, you need to just fucking, you, you can't do that. You mm -hmm. cannot do that. And that has to be recognized and you have to recognize that you can't do it. And then you have to recognize your part in it, which is most of it. Mm -hmm. And then just... <laughs> And then stop, you know, and yeah. say, oh, well, I'm not going to do that. And when I catch myself doing that because of my early imprinting or whatever imprinting, or because I did that for whoever, whatever reasons in the past, I have to know that that switch is going on or that switch is in there. And I have to go and go, no, 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 no. I'm going to turn this other switch that I didn't know I had, mm. you know, previously. So those are my, um, little bits to yeah do it. it you know it definitely takes pressure off when you're able to um do that you know like realize that you cannot change the world and and sometimes you really can't even change yourself unless like you really want to uh, but I, I love your analogy of like the wave and water and, you know, it makes me think of like, yeah, again, you know, like if you're in a river, but you're like trying to grasp on and you're holding on and the rivers just wants to take you like, just go with the river, like go with the flow, you know, like uh, Bruce Lee said, be like water. Yeah. And so I, I like, I really like that. And, you know, yeah. Good. Do you have a time limit, Siri? um no not not particularly how long have we been going like an hour or so hour 15 i have a six o'clock appointment but um okay i want to go a little longer so you talked about magnesium uh and i thought about something and i'm like okay this is not quite the time for the transition but you said how it kind of purged your system and i thought <laughs> combo ah yes <laughs> well i i want to lead up to this because it's sure. it's I've experienced it. I thought it was something else going in, but, and then I, I went with it and well, what, what makes you come to that? that that's just, that's just the first, you say, okay, I'm going to, and I'm not playing it. This is a weird way to say it, but I'm going to have someone burn me and then I'm going to rub frog poison into the burn. And then my body is going to purge and, Lots of people say, yeah, I'm going to do that. Beautiful. Good, good, good question. So let's, let's put some context in this for Please. listeners and viewers. Uh, what Daniel's talking about is uh, combo, which is um, it's from the Amazon jungle. Uh, many tribes there uh, in Brazil, Peru, Colombia, they all have their own version, not version, but they all practice it in one way. And essentially, like Daniel said, is you're taking the poison, which technically it's not actually a poison. It's just a secretion that the frog makes to um, protect itself. And it also helps keep it moist in the jungle. Um, so it's, it's not like a venom. Like the difference is a venom is like something like a spider will bite you and put venom in you, right? Um, so essentially what it is, uh, the, the secretion from the frog ha is loaded with these peptides. And they're actually peptides that are bioavailable in our body, meaning they, when we, so the process is, and um, if you guys wanna go look it up, it's called Combo, K-A-M-B-O, and definitely I encourage you to do some research, but essentially how it's applied, you don't drink it, you don't smoke it, it's not a psychedelic, it's not psychoactive, but the way it's applied is through um, very small burn holes on the skin, and when I say small, I mean small, it's not, you know, it's not like cigarette size, but it's maybe like, you know, half a pinky size, and they're just getting the outer layer of skin. So that top dermis layer. So it's not like a deep, deep burn. It's like very, you know, you just very gently press it to the skin, almost like you get like a little blister. And just like a blister, you can wipe away that. 
And what that does is gives you access to the lymphatic system. So interestingly, these tribes, these shamanic tribes, these deeply indigenous, like connected to the land tribes, learned how to like give themselves like a jungle IV because it, it doesn't go right into the vein. It's not like in, in the vein, but because it opens up that skin layer, it goes into the lymphatic system, which does enter your blood like almost instantaneously. Um, so essentially when it does, so what brings somebody to that point? Well, you know, the history of combo is all like word of mouth folklore. So there's not like textbooks of like when and where it started, you know, it's not written and recorded down. Um, those jungle tribes don't, all their language is verbally spoken. Um, very briefly, and you guys, I encourage you to go look it up, but um, there was a shaman in his tribe and the tribe was like all sick. Everyone was sick. He tried every modality, every plant, everything he knew how to do and nothing was helping. And um, the story goes, he had a, a strong plant medicine journey. It could have been an Aya ceremony. It could have just been like, you know, himself connecting with the spirits. But in that vision, he um, saw the frog. He saw the how to uh, extract the secretion, which is very simple, actually. But take that secretion, do the burn holes, put it in, and that would heal everyone. And, you know, the story goes that he followed his vision. He did that. And then it did heal his tribe. Now, this has been practiced for, I would probably say thousands of years, but I think the first like recorded um, uh, account of this is maybe within a hundred, if not like a few hundred years. But again, that's just because they didn't have like written recordings of these things. You know, it doesn't mean they weren't being practiced, but I also don't want to like give false information that I don't accurately know. So um, it was first kind of discovered by Westerners, meaning when they went to the tribes in the early 1900s or early 20th century. Um, that's when um, they kind of saw the process of what was happening here. And so to give everyone a little idea of what's going on is by putting the secretion on the body and having it enter the blood, these peptides, it's like a cocktail of peptides, act and work with the body to do a number of things. So one, it's a vasodilator. So it opens up all the blood and it like really gets the blood pumping. Um, one of the peptides is, um, it's, I don't know all their names because there's really a lot of them, but one of them is, uh, it's similar to morphine. It's like 400 times stronger. It, you only get a little bit, but it has this great analgesic effect. So there is a feel good effect to it. Um, your whole body gets like warm and flush and you feel the blood come up and down. And like the a feeling that I get is I feel like there's electricity in my hands. Like everything's pumping. Some people, their hands get so clenched that like they can't even open their hands. It's called like tetany. Um, some people it's a little overwhelming and they actually, because of if they have low or high blood pressure, they can faint, but that doesn't happen very often. And if they do faint, they're like, they're back really fast. You, you're only gone for like a second or two um, and your heart's beating. And one of the peptides um, interacts with the gut and the stomach and makes you extremely nauseous. And so there's a purging aspect to it. Um, and so it's a very deeply like purging, like cleanses out your gut, your gallbladder. Um, and the whole experience is like, as little as eight to 10 minutes and as long as really like 20 to 25 minutes. It's not like hours long, you know, it's a very like fast condensed experience and most often culminating in some sort of a purge. And, you know, just for anyone that's listening, it's, it's a different kind of purge than you've probably ever experienced because you do about a 12 hour fast beforehand. So there's no food in your belly. And right before you do uh, apply the combo, you drink about at least one liter, if not even two liters of water. And so your belly's like really full. And that way, when you do feel that like nausea, which comes on after about like five, some people it happens immediately. Some people it's five, some people 10, maybe some people it takes 20 minutes. Everyone's different. Um, but when you feel that come on, you have like 
a bunch of liquid in your belly to purge. And so when the purge comes, it's unlike any other purge you've had. We have buckets and you just like let it out into the bucket and it, it comes out oftentimes projectile. Sometimes it's like clear liquid. Sometimes it's a little foamy. Sometimes it's filled with bile and the bile can either be like yellow, blue, green. Sometimes it gets into like the um, brownie dark area, which, you know, again, like everyone's got different stuff going on. So I, and there's not, been like a lot of scientific studies done on this. So no one actually knows exactly what all the different colors mean and, and exactly fully what's going on. However, when you go through that purge and you're done, it's kind of like you're reborn. Like you feel like a new human. Um, the reason I came to Combo is actually in a very similar time from when I read the book you recommended to me. I was experiencing inflammation, chronic pain in my body. Um, my, I felt like my purpose wasn't in alignment with what I was doing. And as soon as I was done with Combo, man, it like lined me up. I felt whole in my body. I felt amazing. I felt connected, like the pain and inflammation started to go away. And it was, it was pretty life-changing. And um, so I worked with it probably about 10 times here in Los Angeles with a few different practitioners. And then I went to the jungle to do a deep dive to um, become a facilitator of that medicine myself, which was life-changing in and of itself. Yeah, it's it's funny, like talking about going to the jungle because I have like this picture in my head, you know, and it seems mildly unsanitary. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, but the, that's were you were you frightened when you went down there? Hmm. Um, really good question. So being in the jungle, that was actually the first trip by myself that I took, like outside of this country. Um, since I was seven years old when I went to India. And um, I've done a lot of processing about going to India when I was seven, but all the way up into my adult life, I carried a lot of like, kind of the, it was like very traumatic. And so I carried a lot of that trauma in me. And so when I went down to the jungle as an adult, but going on this trip alone, even though I was there with, you know, 16 other people on this little village outside of um, Iquitos, Peru, um, it brought up all this like buried trauma from when I was younger. And so like every night I would like cry and cry and cry and cry and cry. And it felt so good. And I just, it was like tears that I never let myself have when I was seven. And so I felt it was very healing and very cathartic. But um, to answer your question about being scared, you know, I, I really wasn't. There, there wasn't anything I was really scared of. You know, um, where we were going in the jungle, it wasn't, um, it wasn't like ferocious, like super wild jungle, meaning like it's not a place where like giant snakes and jaguars were hanging out. Like, you know, we're, we're only 60 kilometers outside of like a pretty big city. So it's definitely the jungle and there's like nothing out there except for our hut. But, you know, like, uh, five kilometers that way, there's like another village. And if you walk like two kilometers that way, you get to the main road. So like, I wasn't scared of big predators at all. Um, if anything, the worst part about it were the mosquitoes. Like, right. and so we have to have a mosquito net around our bed. And we also live in a hut that had a mosquito net. And even then I got eaten alive. Like even here in LA, I get eaten alive. Right. Um, but I've always had a pretty big arachnophobia, a uh, fear of spiders. And so that was, if there was one fear, that was the biggest fear that I wrestled with. And um, I have a whole experience with, uh, to share about that. But essentially, you know, going in, there was one day that um, we were sitting in our, the main maloka, which is we're all gathering as a group. And, you know, like you'll see spiders off in the distance and you'll see them in certain areas. And it's like, okay, that's fine. But you're <laughs> sitting there at night and there's a fire. And then all of a sudden, one of our participants in the circle was like, holy, you know, oh shit, there, you know, there's a spider on the ground and there's this baby tarantula. And it was this big and this was the baby. And so we we're like, okay, you know, the instructor was just like, all right, you know, that's just a baby. It's okay. And they're like calm. They see them all the time. So I go home 
uh, to my hut after that. I'm a little shaken because I'm like, whoa, that was a little close. And on the path home at nighttime, like holes in the ground there are spider dens. And so at night and during the daytime, you don't see them. But at night, they kind of perch right at the center of their hole. And so like walking back at night, I would look in these holes and like there was a spider and you get closer and like dive back in. And so I saw three of those on my way home. So the spider energy was like hitting me strong. And as soon as I went to bed that night, you know, I still like, I just had the jitters. And as I closed my eyes, I had all these like, closed eye visuals of just like spiders in so many different forms like tarantulas and different spiders and legs and things shifting and it was really intense and I just had to like observe and ask like what was going on and I was like because I've always had a fear of spiders and so I, I I kind of like leaned into that fear in that moment and was just like what like what is this what is happening and this voice started speaking to me of like the spiders, first and foremost, are way more scared of us than we are of them. And I, so that was like a massive awareness. And I was like, oh. And the other awareness was like, they're not trying to hurt you. You know, they're not trying to get you. Like movies make it out. Like if there's a spider in a movie, it's like going to attack you. And it's like, yes, yeah, some, there's some spiders that will do that. But for the most part, they get the hell out of there. They're like scared for their lives of us. And so I, I did this processing like right before I went to bed and I actually had this like very calming feeling come over me. And so what was really wild is the next morning we all meet back in the Maloka to do um, our, you know, our session together. And it was the very first day that we were self-administering the combo because the first two days, the facilitators were serving us. And this was the first day I was going to serve myself. And I was the first person to go out of our whole group. And so I sit up against uh, this wall of the Maloka and it's all, um, it's all netting. Uh, Cause it's like open air, but mosquito netting and lo and behold, this gigantic tarantula probably. So if the baby one was this size, this one must've been like this big, like twice as big as my hand starts crawling down the side. And Jeez. now I'm, I know I'm not scared of it. It was on the outside. We were on the inside and the whole time I served myself and I went through my combo experience, it just sat there and, and I just like, I was like, this is my guardian. Like this guy is like, I wasn't scared. I was like, oh, this, this is like my friend right now. And the second I like had my purge and I went through it, he went away. So I had this oh, like really transformational experience with my, my biggest fear, which is arachnophobia, which I don't have that fear anymore. And granted, you know, I don't want spiders crawling on me, but I don't have, I'm not like scared of them if I see them. I'm cool, you know, way different uh, from when I was younger. It's cr amazing listening to that story, the whole story, because I started to think, are we led to these things such as combo or these experiences or like going to uh, South America? Because it feels to me like you were drawn to this, to go in, uh, deal with the the stuff you had dealt with going to india and then also were able to deal with this spider thing and the, like two very deep rooted things that were inside of you that were kind of uh i don't want to say solved but like you like you had to uh face them mm -hmm. and like like turning around and facing the dragon and then you know it's just, it struck me. Do you, do you have thoughts on that? Like yeah. So um, interestingly, you know, going down there, that was not my um, goal to like solve these two issues. Like you said, <laughs> they were actually like a very magical byproduct of that. Um, and so I just knew somewhere in my body, like essentially we had a, we had a ceremony here at our, our place, a combo ceremony, and we, it was a three day back to back to back. And so every, I did it every day, three days in a row. And it was at the end of the third day that 
I, it, it hit me so hard that I knew I was going to be able to facilitate this medicine and offer really powerful experiences for our community. And I knew it right then. I was like, wow. So I, I pretty much you know, booked my ticket, found the training. My other friend, David Daniel, had already gone to this village, did his training right before I did. So he gave me the info and it just called me. And, and you know, so if, if there's something to say is like, if you're feeling a calling to something, if for any listeners or even you or anyone, like follow that voice, like, like go for it. And in that process, like let there be like discoveries along the way, you know, it, it's almost... It's almost like that cliche saying like, life isn't about the destination, it's about the journey, right? And that's almost right. what happened there because the destination for me was getting my combo training. Right. The journey was, you know, going to another country, like being on my own, like converting money, being, fortunately I speak Spanish. So I was able to like be there on my own and speak Spanish and get by, but then, you know, like dealing with all these other things and, and actually, the the childhood trauma from going to india and the spider thing were like two pretty big fears or things that i was able to work with and you know so it was in the journey that all of that healing actually happened so you know that's my share of that <laughs> that's great because the message the message that i am now getting the message is like because i might say to myself i don't fucking want to go to south america and get poisoned by a frog you know but that's not the point, like necessarily, right? The, the point like is if you're drawn to this thing is like not to try to see the end result, yes. but just to keep moving forward because the end result may change. Mm -hmm. You know, you still, it might still be the end result, but all these things that happen on the path aiming for this so-called end result may have much larger beneficial impact on your life than the end result. I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, even for example, one of the um, participants in the um, group that I was doing the training in, you won't even believe this. I, I make it down to South America. I meet up with one of our trainers in the big city before we go to the jungle. And he was like, oh, there's somebody else from Los Angeles in this training. When I meet the other guy, his name is Sal, and this is a shout out to Sal if you ever hear this. Sal, when I first meet him, not only did he live in Los Angeles, but he lived in Toluca Lake where I live, and ah. he literally lives less than a mile from me. And wow. we are still friends to this day. And he's an amazing healer, acupuncturist, Western or uh, Eastern medicine. And so like, again, that was another amazing byproduct. And you know, it's the friendships and the connections. and. And yeah, you know, like it's, it's definitely good to have the destination in mind, but you know, of course be flexible and just allow yourself to go on the journey. Right. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One more thing. Do you want to tell the world anything? Um, well, I like what you, what you were bringing up, just like, keep going, you know, keep going. Like there's going to be highs, there's going to be lows, there's going to be everything in between, but you know, tr like trust in yourself, trust in the power of either whatever you believe in, if it's the universe or God or a specific God or religion, like trust in that and, and like keep going, like things shift there. It's never always low. It's never always high. It's never always in the middle. It's always a, some sort of beautiful ride, but life does get better. It does. And I, I love you, Daniel. This, this was really awesome. Oh, and, beautiful, um, man. I love you too. Yeah. If anyone does want to follow us, I'm sure you'll put it in the comments, but we are Yoga Galactica, um, myself and my partner, Kamala. If you want to learn more about Combo, you can go to our website. It's Combo Shift, which is K-A-M-B-O Shift, like shift uh, all one word. And um, you can find me all over the internet, Siri Kalsa. Is it, a, a, is it dot com? Yeah. Or wait, well, combo, combo shift. Yeah, yeah. shift.com. It is. Okay. Yeah. That'll be in the show notes and then everyone could also hear it there. Right. Um, awesome. Thank you, sir. That was awesome. You're welcome. Thank you, Daniel. And I'm, I'm honored to have you uh, to be here and I'm just honored to be your friend. Like you, you've been a really big inspiration on my, 
uh, path to being a teacher and being like an authentic teacher as well. So I, I want to give you a shout out and I always do amongst our community as well, but just let it be known here publicly for the record. Like I, I love you, man. I, I value oh, you. I appreciate you. I love you too. And I, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you, Siri. And I'm going to stop this recording in a moment. Everybody listening, uh, please share, subscribe, tell your friends. If you're on the uh, Apple format, uh, give me the rating and the stars. And thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to say goodbye to Siri separately, but I'm saying goodbye to all of you. And thank you for coming on the journey and the ride. And good night.